COVID-19 Architects Colloquium. Theme, Architecture and the National Development Agenda 12. Sub-themes, Reworking the Past of Architecture, Collapsed Building, Contemporary Issues in Architecture, Sustainability and Energy Efficiency in Buildings. With the Professional Class, Executive Order 5 and the Place of Architecture and the Construction Industry. Exploring and Exploiting the Potentials of Resettlement of IDPs, Smart Architecture and Building Trends and Styles. Venue, Show Musa Yaradua Center Abuja. Time, 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily. Three days of seminars and exhibition of reputable organizations in the built environment. Date, 24th to 26 April 2019. This is an avenue to interact professionally, discourse and dialogue specifically on architecture, built environment, national development and related issues. Them. 
the developers from coming to invest. Okay, can I just go straight to the design itself? Table so one, slide twenty-six. Slide twenty-six. Thank you. From that table, that's the percentage analysis of the root causes of bidding failure in the metropolis. After we have sent, have sent out one hundred and ten procedures according to the promotion, different professionals, it was deduced that the first lack of approved structural design was you know, to the highest cause of bidding failure. Secondly, by absence of bidding or planning permit. Third, by adoption of wrong foundation. Table two. Okay, table two was the hypothesis, so we get that at the end. Table two, percentage analysis of the means of coming the menace. Looking at the, re the means of coming this menace, the first was quality materials. If we put our materials, but if we use as architects, if we specify quality <coughs> materials, and also uh, ensure that the designs, both architectural and social, are, are good designs, and also involve the professionals, are being involved according to the third one, involvement of professionals. If the right professionals are being involved, I'm sure this you know, will help to reduce the menace of bidding failure. Next one. Look at this regression analysis of bidding failure. The table shows that an R value of 0.954 was greater than the median value of 0.910 and an R value of 0.5. And because the R value was 0.954, this predicts that there's another 10% of the effect of building failure on the people and economy and the environment in our primary state. Finding of this study indicate that the estate of the effect is very high. Because 910% shows that the effect of bidding failure in the people and the economy of our states, in our state of Kwaibu, in the metropolis in particular, the, the effect is very hard. Slide 31. Analysis of variance testing the extent of the effects. The above table represents the eighth value, which here shows that from the p value of 000, it's below 0 0.05. And the result, therefore, means that the extent of effect of building failure on its people, economy, and environment is also very high. And this implies that the effect is highly predictive and significant. Don't forget that the hypothesis showed that the hypothesis was that it, is, it was not high. The effect of building failure on its people and economy of our private state was not high. But now, during the research, it has been showed that this effect is very high. Now, look at the recommendations. The following are recommendations. One, more awareness campaign should be carried out by the three types of government. You know, looking at the fact that at the lower government level, there are rules and regulations. At the state level, there are laws. At the federal level, there are, there are acts. And as we have said here since yesterday about you know, doing, using the APRA and RA, but much has to be done also at the lower government level to ensure that the, the states and the lower government level put in the architects so that the designs that have been sent to the planning authorities could be assessed and be given the right touch. The same as the planning authorities should maintain competent professionals in the relevant areas for design approval. I want to make it of point of interest here that before in acquiring, we did not actually have architects in planning authorities in the lower government. If not for the effort of the chapter of the Nigerian Sub Architect, who went through the assistance of the Honorable Commissioner, who is an architect, and they met the governor, and they had to ensure that we have architects. And as I speak to you now, we have some, even though all the government don't have, but the majority of the government have architects who are looking into our plans that we submitted. So the policymakers in the country should be less suspicious of professional advice. At times, we as architects, we are looking at good things for our communities, for our localities. But the policy makers, they are not looking at it that way. They tend to trust what effort the architect tries to make. So I'm looking at the policy makers who look at the professional advices as what will help us to cope issues like 
big failure in the future, the profession and our society will have less issues of collapse. Thank you. The next speaker of presentation is yeah. Professor David Hughes. Great greetings from the United States. Of oh, honor to be here to the uh, the uh, colloquium. Uh, this is a very special opportunity. Approximately 2,000 words, so you will get many times more continent of Africa. Uh, this work required exhaustive travel and research, and that. We start with the idea that Africa has always made a significant impact on the uh, world of global architecture. In fact, the greatest of all of the ancient uh, wonders of the world are right here in Africa. Uh, the breadth of African contributions from the beginning of time go not just to Kemet or ancient Egypt, but to Ethiopia. And in fact, the cross you saw there was the, uh, one of the greatest pieces of architecture recognized around the world, and that is the stone-cut church of Lalibala. We can go even further into Africa, to the south. These that one time were the centers of the world. We can go to uh, very unique places like the villages of the Dogon region in Mali, where it has been determined that the scientists and the astrologers there indeed were able to predict to the same degree of certainty as European scientists like Copernicus that the coming of a particular uh, comet or a particular eclipse of the sun. We can also show that some of this great work is of significant structure. And that indeed African architecture has been replicated and utilized throughout the world. Of course, you recognize these two very important monuments. You recognize, of course, the pyramid and I.M. Pei's adaption of this for the Louvre in Paris. We know that abstract uh, images that come out of African culture you know, have been adopted throughout the years uh, by the Cubists and many others uh, to project what they call uh, modern architecture. And we have right here in the great kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, Sanjay, which is the centerpiece of modern day Nigeria, the uh, uh, images from the uh, Benin kingdoms, and we have a lot of rural expressions throughout the continent that say this is not some ordinary building type. It has many types. We also know that the use of space can be distinct in Africa. And that finally we begin to see, even in our modern 20th century and soon 21st century, images of architecture that come directly from African input. Now here we show that there are simply uh, the ability to cast images uh, on a building that would give it an African context. And we've seen this throughout the continent. Here in uh, Cameroon, which is where I had the opportunity to lecture on more than uh, one occasion on this tour. And you see the apparent and obvious uh, image. We have Oh, okay, so I, I went from 20 minutes to 10, okay. I have two more minutes to finish this up. But I hope that you, uh, okay, take a, take a little more, thank you. So we're going to keep moving, because we want, to, want you to see 
that indeed there are inspirations throughout Africa. So we'll just keep moving with the time that's allotted. Here you see the Togana, a typical building in Mali that all of a sudden becomes the basis for form of a building in a university, a modern university. We see other patterns that become replicated in building design. And we see that now significant, substantive, uh, substantial architecture. This is the Bank of West African States in Ouagadougou, borrows its image from the Dogon region. These tall, uh, rectilinear towers are replicated now in this design. I found here in just a couple of days in uh, Abuja that a lot of images seem to appreciate the cultural elements of original African artifacts, the cylindrical <coughs> shapes of these buildings. In fact, really one right across the way here replicate or at least cast an appreciation for these uh, elements. I met one of the premier architects in Africa, Gudi Abi, and that was many years ago. He did this building, which was the centerpiece, the headquarters nearby in Lome, which had a lot of African references. And he did other buildings. And now you want to establish the theory, which is the, the essence of the paper. And the theory says that you can teach this, you can find a way to establish a method to design and build based on this that can be taught universally. When I taught at Zambia as a Fulbright scholar, I had African students, brilliant young men and women, and I said, just use your own imagination. Don't be locked into any preconceived notion of what modern architecture was. And these students did tremendous work with very modest means. And uh, we continued this idea now back at my school in America, Kent State, where the student body was primarily Caucasian, but that only means they were divorced, I felt, from any emotional attachment. Now we wanted a theory that is based on science and methodology. So I asked them to look at African images and elements and to begin to abstract them, as you see, into design ideas. This was uh, a building design. We picked a modern site and we picked a, a way in which we could is illustrate its modern application. This particular student took the Bombada statue and they crafted this idea for a building. Uh, this student took one and reduced it to a Part T and then that Part T became a building expression. The next one took a, another uh, building mask, a boule mask, and morphed it from one level of uh, abstraction to another into a building uh, design. Another one took a amulet from uh, Egypt and then placed it both uh, in plan and in section and came up with this building design. Another uh, took a building uh, where the elements of Africa's vast range of environments could be represented, but only in a very abstract way. The glass tower represents water, the folded plate uh, design represents rocks and land, and then the finial at the top represents the trees or the forest or bush in Africa. So it's all abstracted. This particular one took elements that were represented in a building that's so distinct, if you didn't see the elements, you would ask yourself, what's Afrocentric about it? But that's the point. We can craft an image and a building and a design based on our elements and our definition, 
without carrying those things as if they were a big signpost. This one was based on the uh, tall drum. And when it's put in its setting, you see that it worked both as an element and within the context of that modern setting. This one, once again, it borrows all of its elements from an African mask, but yet if you did not see that mask, you would still see a very beautifully crafted uh, high-rise building. Uh, we were asked, can you do something other than tall buildings? Yes, and so we started showing how sketches and elements could go lead to uh, something like a church. Here you see this in overhead, this model, 3D model. But if you look at the drawings, uh, you'll see very ornate and very well-defined program and plan. You see the inspiration, and you see some of that even zoomed in on the model to show that it reflects these figure ground drawings and then the building itself. Uh, this particular one took a mask and made a house out of it. And all of these, by the way, have distinct plans. One of the things that I could say is that this theory continued to build, continued to grow, and it was beginning to be taught outside of my realm. This is a school in Washington, D.C. Colleagues of mine had their students do this work. This work was so well received that it ultimately was taken to Liberia, where the government had asked these students to come up with this concept. Uh, I then came here, and this is what this tour is all about. I was very pleased when I came to the school uh, in uh, Yaoundi and found that this work was already there. It was already being taught. And I had never been to Cameroon. So it just shows you that this thing can work. And as we continue to go, we're going to show you now that it's existing in reality. Uh, so this building was designed as a museum in Detroit with all kinds of African uh, elements in, involved in its design. The next one uh, was a park that was designed in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. This was designed by a good friend of mine who asked me to transmit to him all of the images I took when I was at Great Zimbabwe. And he came up with this design. He also borrowed from me the images of the great churches in Lalibaba and came up with this design for a modern church in Atlanta, Georgia. He then did this building, and what we're so proud about in this building is that he decided to do a very strong abstraction so that it's a powerful church, but you wouldn't see the origins of a mask in there unless I showed you the mask. But what you do see are the adinkra symbols that are built into the bell tower. He also, and this is this group, and by the way, just to point out, not only is this a team of our architects, I have said this, I uh, had an opportunity to say it a couple of days while I've been here, I am absolutely impressed and overwhelmed with the number of female architects in Nigeria. You should give yourself a big round of So there are other buildings, other images. We're going to keep moving through these. But this is the crowning achievement. And we're going to end this here with the fact that this building, which is the last major building to be built on the mall in Washington, DC, the capital of the United States, was built and designed based on Afrocentric architecture. This was not something politically you could have run around and screamed before the building was built. But now that it is, the cat's out of the bag, as we might say. The next image will show the three architects. And the one I know is everybody knows David Ajay. 
But I know personally the other two. Max Bond in the middle was my professor when I was at Columbia. Phil Freelon was a colleague of mine from the beginning of his practice. We both have had practices for about 40 years. And what they did was they took the, the, the first, the other two, I know them well, and they knew Afrocentric architecture when it first came out. They took the top portion of that uh, African artifact, the crown, and made a crown out of this building. So I like to say Afrocentric architecture is here and the theory is real. Thank you very much. Through the use of color, that is proposing a color scheme for Department of Architecture in Nazaria. Um, before I start, I want to talk about uh, the creation of God. When He created living and non-living things, He gave them color. And this color depicted a meaning to every living and non-living thing. So you could be able to differentiate between each and every living and non-living thing. And in biology, taking humans as example, we have different shades of colors. We can be identified by these different shades of colors apart from the formal characteristics that we obtain. So as in architectural design, if we, uh, after a, an architect designs a building, he also gives it um, a final touch, which is the color scheme. So this, um, this is also very important. Uh, for the introduction, I have some few things to say. It's all about the result of teaching and learning process. It equals to the receiving of new information and new concepts. So how do we get this? It's through discussion, interaction, reflection, and adaptation. So this discussion is between the teacher and the learner. Then between, for interaction, it's between the learner the outcome that the student gets. So how do we uh, normally obtain this? We have the color wheel. So following uh, the problem statement, uh, certain colors affect us in a positive and negative way. So the, uh, the environment we live in is very, very important to take note of. So we are going to take the um, Department of Architecture as an example for the color scheme. We are going to investigate it. So for the aims and objectives, uh, the, the main aim is to encourage students' academ academic enthusiasm and create a study-friendly atmosphere in the Department of Architecture through comprehensive use of color scheme. The existing one which has been uh, kept. So, for the findings of the literature review, uh, the first one talks about colors have emotional impact, uh, given temperature, uh, strong and weak, then hard and soft. These are feelings that these colors uh, create for individuals. So, the red acts as warm, and then blue acts as a um, cold, which is passive. Blue is for passive, and then red is for active. So wherever you see red, it is active. So colors give a sense of psychological and physical feeling too, as well. So for the methodology, can we move to the methodology? Yeah. Um, I collected, um, I'm using the qualitative method through the questionnaires, um, about 150 um, questionnaires were distributed, and then after that, I retrieved uh, 94 of them. So from the 94, from the 94, we have, we 
results and discussion. So in the results and discussion, um, we have the ratio for gender, which is 58 male and 36 female. And then in the age, we have 17 to 24, which is 48 in number. And then 25 to 30, which is 32 in number. And 31 and above, which is 14 in number. So the occupation is um, just a staff to students. We have 12, and then the students are about 82 that were the questionnaires were distributed. The marital status, we have singles to be 65, married to be 28, and then divorced to be one. So that's it for the, uh, uh, could you show the, the, the existing picture for the Department of Architecture? Before we move to the results, and the, so this is a table showing the existing um, color for color scheme for the Department of Architecture. Uh, the floor area, the walls, the ceilings. These are the distributions. I'm not going to go further since you have some of them in your booklet, so you can read further. So we could move to the next. Uh, the results. Can we go to the results and discussion? Results and discussion continue.
where we can function properly, have our parties, socialize, and then it will also reduce the cost of buildings. You don't need to break down in future and put all those things in place. And there is economic viability. Next. So much of the existing um, belt environment, they predate inclusive access consideration. They still have significant barriers, like um, uneven steps and risers, um, slippery achieve all the goals we've mentioned in a sustainable integrated community. We have to have continuity of accessibility from the extreme. I'm coming to do this presentation. And at this moment, I have a problem with movement, and I get to use a wheelchair. I get in there, and it's good. There's a ramp, a good finishing. I get inside, I do my registration, and I come up here. I won't be able to come to the stage. So we have to have this accessibility component right from the exterior in out of 246 selected public buildings in Enugu Metropolis. Can you go to the next one? So this study involved a one-time observation of the building components and then some measurements were taken. Then it's already difficult for an able-bodied person, let alone so a crippled person coming here, somebody on a wheelchair coming to that church. This one is a hotel. You can see from the hotel, they only have stairs. They don't even have a ramp. Let's go. Next one, please. That one is a library in Enugu Metropolis. With a wheelchair, you need ample clearance. And also with the crutches, for instance, you need ample clearance to pick your books from the shelf and sit. It's not good. This one is equally a hotel. Go back to the next one. The next one, please. Well, this one looks like um, everybody living with disability we are going to ascend into heaven already because they have a whole lot of flight of stairs. Next one. And that is the building that has an e-tree. Okay, and, and that this is a, a hospital. We can see for us uh, solve the problem already. The entrance is already poorly lit. Good enough, the in interior spaces are good. They had good finishings on their floor and they had ample um, clearance on the width. Next one. Okay, from the study, this is what we could um, get. Did we actually get it right in Enugu? You can see that for the entrances, the most accessible, the most in inaccessible buildings were the ones that provide domestic um, f um, services, showing in red. Then the one that was most accessible was educational facilities. The most in the inaccessible linking entrance, the building that had that was also the domestic and the educational facility. And then for accessibility, the transport um, build the buildings that provide transportation services were really accessible. And this, totally, look at the number of the, the all total education facility was most accessible. Can we go to the next one? Yeah, to show this one better, let's go to the um, pie chart. The pie chart shows the level of accessibility of the 246 building. Sadly, out of 246 buildings assessed in Enugu Metropolis, only just two was fairly accessible. So can, did we get it right in Enugu? The next one. For the entrances, nearly 15% of the entrances were accessible good. We had low ramp width, slope accessibility, and for industrial and hospital buildings. Domestic building had the highest inaccessibility of entrances. And for linking routes, about 90% of the door width were accessible. Half of the door threshold were accessible, especially in healthcare facilities. The next one. Um, the ramp and steps in industrial and hospitality building entrances might have been a coincidence. And what? The next one will say this better. Let's go to the next one, please. So the sum summary of the finding is that the buildings with ramps and entrances were accessible, compliant in their width and in their length, but their slope was too steep. And then the lowest accessibility compliance in domestic buildings this could be attached to um, quackery, pe people that don't do proper research when their clients give them brief. And then um, the step tread in accessibility in domestic and educational facilities. We are, most of us are really comfortable with the 150-300 rise going relationship, which is 
for comfort and safety in everybody led. But when it comes to disability, this is not the proper relationship we should take. There's a difference for us that rights re relationship in interior spaces and outside at the entrances. Then for high door with accessibility compliance in industrial, educational, religious, and transportation building, it, it seemed to be really good. But you see that in our industrial and factory buildings, we will need a ramp to bring in the goods, the heavy goods and equipment into the space. It doesn't mean that these things were put for disability consideration. Next one. Oh, in, in how to get it right? How do we get it right? It's good to seek the opinion of not just the client but the end user in, in the design of our building. Then inclusive access consideration should be incorporated right from the project inception. Then aspect of accessibility should be properly and comprehensively enshrined into the Nigerian building code. And then for quality assurances, we should have check and balances to monitor if what we put on paper is actually on site. Can we go to the next one? This is a slide of um, accessible buildings in other countries. Go back. Keep going forward, please. Sorry. Yeah, forward. Forward. So, how to get it right? There were some key points on how to get it right. It's all in our paper. And then this one was um, a project role on how to get it right when we are designing for inclusive access. Another of the uh, another of the item on the appendix was if you go forward, you see that was um, the inclusive access design process. In conclusion. Designing for one person is designing for all. Thank you. This is for the delivery of the paper. Okay, you can go. Um, I understand that. Uh, He's also a medical doctor. Daniel, we take the year round. Uh, council, council members, colleagues, guests, all other protocols observed. I'm here to present a paper. Archipreneurship as a panacea for the survival of architects in Nigeria in a changing world. By mentor. Architect Dr. Hussein Udo, fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. My name is Architect Daniel Denton. Please, let's go on. Uh, in terms of abstract, the paper seeks to question the status quo of architectural training vis a vis present day challenges facing us as architects in a free economy. It highlights the opportunities yet available. Some of these opportunities we already know. But we must uh, see them and pursue them through a web of uh, through a web of uh, facts presented synthetically. We bring the conclusion is actually that every architect still needs to be retooled if we must succeed in our world as it is. Reworking the past, dealing with present challenges and uh, architecture of uh, the very near future. Please, let's continue. By way of introduction, architecture we already know is the science in theory and practice of design, erection, commissioning, maintenance, management, and coordination of allied professional inputs, delta of buildings, you know, up to master plan level, required for human and other activities. This is uh, as captured by the Aconat. An entrepreneur in this context is typically someone who starts a company based on the innate mindset of his or her person to see opportunities and pursue them. We are not saying the architect is blind per se, because interestingly we are the most imaginative set of human beings in the world. But we are by training not trained to see opportunities. By training we are trained to see problems. In fact, to put it in perspective, we are trying to see design problems. See through the design process and you now find design solutions. We are not trained to see opportunities. And that is the problem of today's practice. Please, let's continue. 
statement of problem. Without a doubt, the fundamentals of architecture is unchanged. That is a reality, right from uh, Vitruvius's first treatise, Fermitas, uh, Utilitas, and Venustas. It's still the same thing. We've only added a cost value dimension you know, in recent times. However, the commercial goal of advancing peculiar plans' interests, let me explain that. In today's present world, we may not all acknowledge it, but the world is in a global recession. So whether it's the poor person in the village that we were talking about yesterday, Taraba State, or it's the rich clients, people need to borrow money to do projects. So when you are doing projects, doing designs for those kind of people, they are not just looking at the comfort or the convenience. The investor wants to be able to pay back on his investments and still make money. That is a niche that we all ought to consider. Another aspect is changes in societal structure. I noticed recently, there is a common demographic now, even in Nigeria, there is an increasing number of female-headed households. Check the, the last census, do the projections. Historic cities, whether it's from natural causes or from terrorist acts, we have issues of climate change and a rest of media of things that require that as architects we must widen our scope of knowledge. Third, as we problem statement page, most other industry players, please let's go back, just go back a little bit for me. Most other industry players already key into these things. It's the only reason why, for instance, somebody mentioned it yesterday in some states, if not all. A QS, for instance, will prepare the evaluation report and may go on to sign the IPC. It's the only reason. It's the only reason that, for instance, the only course right now that is doing construction management at the professional level is not architecture, it's not civil engineering in Nigerian universities. So other vocations are really looking for what to do to you, instead of just staying in the stereotype. Please, let's continue. We have already just moved on, we already established the game of the studies. Uh, as objectives, we are seeking to review the philosophy of the challenges, to propose a paradigm shift towards entrepreneurship, we will soon define that, then to highlight the inter entrepreneurial opportunities in the world of contemporary architecture. Continue. In terms of literature review and theoretical framework, we already know history that architectural training is uh, in Nigeria is based on the European and American models. Echo this book has from uh, 1795 with all the the focus on visual design and uh, history of classical era. Then uh, Gropius uh, Bauhaus in Germany, that's the American model now, which was made popular after <coughs> the World War's modularization and. Uh, mass production. That is the foundation. And, and uh, we ask, please, let's move on to the next slide. The studio till tomorrow, whether it's in practice or it's in the academia itself, is still, it still embodies what we call the hidden curriculum for the baptism of every will-be or present architect into the profession. It's the setting where such a student or trainee undergoes the transformation that powers the way they relate, whether to the environment, to contemporaries, and to other actors. The design studio, which is our ground zero, also patterns the whole design process, where we experiment by uh, everything in life is risky. But the extent to which you have risk stages. You see it in uh, pre-contract contracts and post-contract, even advocacy. So this word advocacy has continued to come up even since we started uh, this uh, program. Uh, actually, advocacy is a sort of uh, uh, enlightenment and information, but it goes beyond that by trying to make a wider part of the society, part of uh, the watchdog and the, uh, the solution to our problem. So you find out that uh, the professionals alone cannot watchdog or monitor projects. But if we are able to involve 
all the strata of the society, and like uh, the governor was advising on our involvement, the governors. We involve traditional rulers, we involve youth, as much as possible, mobilize them so that they become watchdog and only make us uh, recipients of those information. So that's, we need to go to that level of uh, building up that critical mass. And that is where we can actually manage risk properly. So risk actually uh, involves uh, identifying hazardous uh, issues or difficult or problem areas and try them and then trying to actually mitigate, profile mitigation by way of uh, safety. So uh, this paper tries to do that by trying to uh, evaluate risk assessment analysis control with a probability matrix developed by uh, Schumann and uh, Kama, 2013. Next. Next. Okay. The aim of the paper is to actually develop the consciousness in us to be proactive in managing the risk nature, or risky nature of uh, our profession. And we have to do that by identifying some quantitative approaches and uh, analytical methods so as to help us uh, in actually managing the risk involved in our profession from conception to even post occupancy stages. Next. Next. Okay. So, risk, if we manage this properly, it will help us to increase the uh, GDP contribution of uh, architecture and building process. Because the final that uh, building process or architecture is a way to measure how strong or progressive an economy is because it actually involves a lot of uh, downstream uh, activities. So if we can manage risk properly, it means that we will reduce, not only reduce losses, we will not only reduce uh, the problems we have in the society, we will also increase the contribution of architecture to our economy. So, we go next, next, uh, next, uh, next round. So, the methodology for just the evaluation of uh, some of these uh, issues from conceptualization to uh, post occupancy. And then I want to emphasize something on environmental determinism as uh, a way to actually, if we are conscious of that, that whatever we do in architecture determines the behavior or can manipulate or control the behavior and uh, the economy and sociocultural uh, uh, situations in our environment, our uh, society. So we can use architecture to control and manipulate and actually improve on the performance of uh, not only our people but our economic and sociocultural uh, environment. <laughs> then the uh, Shoma and the Kuma probability matrix is used in trying to assess, analyze, and then control uh, risk in our profession. Next. Next. Okay. Risk uh, has internal and external aspects. While the internal aspect is almost uh, under our control and ma manipulation to some extent, the external ones are uh, not. And um, we remember, like, the external ones, apart from a uh, first majority, the other ones like the country sovereign and uh, currency and foreign exchange risks are things that are directly outside our control. But if, as a, a risk management uh, strategy, we are able to know what happens in uh, the government policy, like the Central uh, Bank of Nigeria policy, like uh, the Nigerian Bureau of, uh, National Bureau of Statistics. Every year we should be able to know what the monetary policy is. Every time we should be able to know what uh, the foreign exchange policy is. So that especially for projects that have international uh, uh, charts, 
developed by Shuma and Kuma, which we feel we can apply. Nisky Ventures, they also have their returns. Next. So, so right now, I know they are presented this on the team, but somehow behind the scenes, I know that this was done not to catch. Even though it's just the thing. So what I'm trying to say, two years down the line, the department already expected me that this I should have a good understanding of how to use the card tools, right? So somehow down the line, seven years down the line now, after more strikes and melodrama on campus, I'm now finally done with my, my studies, I've done my PSC and MSc, and now I'm doing my final year presentation, my final MSc presentation. And now, the middle of presentation now is now uh, printed documents done officially in red to 3D models and all fancy stuff. So what I'm saying now, at this level, the, the school expects me that I have a good understanding of 3D uh, software and all that. So what I'm trying to say, at this level, there's no course in school that is called AutoCAD or Revit or 3DS Max or that. But somehow, the school has made me to pass through that process. And within a period of seven years that I spent in school, the school has put me through a process that took the industry over a thousand years to pass through. What I'm trying to say, the industry has been knowing that so that mankind, right? We all started with normal piece of paper, with our drawing board and all that. When, as far back as the Egyptian era, they used to do their drawings and their drafting with the use of rudimentary instruments. And that was how it persisted all through the medieval era, the ancient ages, the Gothic, um, um, Romanes, Roman, Egyptian era, and all that. Until we got to the Industrial Revolution, right? When we got the Industrial Revolution, then it came with it the what's called the PC Revolution. And computer aided design came into the scene, which is known as the era <coughs> of documentation. So, what is the information world today? So, with the use of the computer now, we can use the data we are generating, we are putting into the software to better visualize our designs. We can use that data to better cost our projects. We can use that data to estimate and even sequence the execution of our projects. We can do a lot of things with that data now. So, somehow, the industry with this era of optimization now, we've been able to optimize our data and we can do a lot of things with our. Designs even before going to site, we can analyze our design for sustainability, and at the end of the design, we are able to hand over all those data to the facility manager for facility management. So these are all the advancements that are taking place in the industry in the area of optimization, right? But now that we've advanced so much in technology and processes, something was still missing in the industry, and that is the people that actually make this possible. So that is the problem with the area of optimization. So gradually, the industry realized that efficiency. And now we are looking at how to actually coordinate all those data and all the information we've been able to generate in the era of optimization to lead us to what is known as the era of connection. So to also bring my home, my point home, I'll just do a, a small case study with uh, a company called Autodesk. In the era of documentation, what we all knew in the industry was something that, right? So that was what we used for our documentation and all that. And then when we progress to the era of optimization, we now started to realize the importance and the advantages of software like Revit, Acrecard, and all that because now we can model and do a lot of things with change and beyond. So, but eventually the industry progressed and when the industry or the, soft, the software company also did to realize that there are still a lot of um, what's called uh, people working in silos in the industry. A typical architect or architectural firm, when they get the project, they go to their own company to do their designs and all that. When they are done, they hand over to the MEP engineers, and when they are done, they have hand over to the structural engineers. So all these people are working inside. In as much as we have the technology in place to actually do a lot more and coordinate and correlate this data, we are still working inside. Them. So that is the major problem of the era of optimization. And now the industry is now looking at how to harness that. And in the process of doing that, they realize that the loophole of the missing pie in all this is actually the data, the cloud. Because today we have the internet, and that is the fastest way to actually carry everybody in the industry along in real time. For example, the people that are designers, they can stay in Tauproof, in Tau, the, all the software can stay communicate with each other, you can export your Revit file to the card, and export it to 3DS Mac, for example, and all that. So, but you realize that this communication is still limited to the design team. So how do you as designers carry the app that the clients that are designing this thing for along? How do you carry them along? So those are the kind of challenges you face in the industry. How do people like the project managers on site, how do they carry along with suppliers and supply chain? So those are the kind of issues. So realize that the fastest way to actually do that is what we do today at the cloud, the entry power of the cloud. So that is exactly what we are. So when by the time you combine BIM and the cloud, it brings about what is known as today as the era of connection. So and 
Like I mentioned the last time, in the era of optimization, we, we, all we knew was Revit, but today as a software or a solution in place known as B360, which is what I'm actually here to highlight for us some of the advantages or some of the uses you can make, you can be able to achieve B360. So I will not be talking about features of the software, I will just be talking about some problems we face in the industry and how we can leverage some of the features we find in this solution to actually solve some of the problems. So the first one we find is what is known as design coordination. In the industry today, like I mentioned, there are so many so much silos in community, there are so many communication gaps, and that is what is causing so many of the headaches we face in the industry today. We find that communication is a very big problem. I worked in a, co in a company for three years back as a system designer, and I wasn't working as an architect for a short period of time. I realized that I needed some information from the architect. So most of the time, I don't even know where the design changes. All I know is that some things will come into my, all my desk and the computer design out. So how do you communicate all these changes in real time? So those are the kind of issues we face. So design coordination, with the use of intricity design, what used to be a local collaboration that you find? All right. So those are the kind of features we're talking about. And you also have the information management, whereby you can enable some features that you find on these two for you to you can easily move into the software and raise what is called an RFI management. So you just subscribe to subsidiaries and we have 140 logistics centers in over 90 countries around the world. Our turnover last year is 1.4 billion, 1.48 billion euros. Perry provides building companies and scaffolding contractors of every site the best solution for efficiently realizing each individual project that they have. Our key competencies are in the development and production of innovative frameworks and scaffolding systems as well as engineering services for customized project solutions. For us, we do not see ourselves only as provider of efficient system technology, but we also see ourselves as source of ideas and support in order to, in order to develop together with our customers the best solution for each case of project. So that's what that's who we are. And Perry Nigeria is a subsidiary of the German of this German firm, Perry. We've been in operation since March 2014. So we go to our slide now. Concrete, plywood itself, homework systems and architectural concrete are the related together, release agents, then concrete as the main element of construction, and then we see project examples where Perry has been involved in such architectural concrete. Next slide. So what's architectural concrete? It is the visible concrete surface which shows the features specified by the architect. So, I mean, if you look around us in this uh, environment, you see actually that the walls are painted, but with architectural concrete, this would already be enveloped in the concrete. So you don't need extra finishing like the paintings you have. Next slide, please. Sorry, go back. One more step. Sorry. Go back one more step. Okay, so what are these features the architect will define? It will define the texture, the tie point pattern, and also the panel to be used, and also the plywood and joint pattern. Okay, next slide. Okay, so how can this be achieved with architectural concrete? Well, for it's not just to tell the contractor I need an architectural concrete with good texture, good finish, or even evenness. They need to be agreed. So he needs to define which quality features should the architectural concrete surface as be. He also needs to know to define which requirements are to be specified in the tender document. All of this has to be specified as well. Which requirements are placed on the formwork in order to form the concrete surface? Form of form work actually determines the, uh, the type of architectural concrete you have. So this has to be defined from the word go in the standard document. So which requirements are placed on the concrete formulation? This has to do with the concrete mix design. It's also amazing. So main factors of influence on quality of architectural concrete. First is the, the, uh, the, the concrete which will come up. Also the release agent is very important. Release agent is applied on the on the top of the form lining, the, the plywood, this also affects the concrete surface. Most important is the form of itself, which is ranging from the plywood, which of the form lining will be used. Is it plywood, is it steel surface, or is it plastic? The form of system, the plywood, and the joint 
patterns and also the type one position. Also influencing concrete is the fresh concrete pressure. Fresh concrete pressure refers to the rate at which you actually pour, how fast you pour. So if you, you can design the, the formal to different concrete pressure and that defines also the architectural concrete. We talk about also the reinforcement is also important. You want to to provide reinforcement for your structures, but such reinforcement should be such that you can place your concrete easily and also you can vibrate easily. Otherwise, you cannot achieve this architectural concrete. Other factors you see from the next slide would be the parts which are included this affects the concrete quality you get and also the completion deadline. Next slide, please. So, what makes up uh, the architectural concrete team? All of these persons shown here are required to, for you to be able to achieve such architectural concrete. So, foremost on the list, on top is the client. He has the money, he has a perspective what he wants for his project, and the architect is called, who has ideas, he brings out the conception. This is done in drawings, and the structural engineer is there also to put the reinforcement, to determine the concrete mix, and also the joints for the structure. And then you have the contractor who is called upon to bring this image into life and we see the reality. Also, where we come in as a formal provider, you need the modes of the formwork to realize such concrete. There is need for also the architectural concrete coordinator. He's responsible and just continue like that with different structures. Even for small structures, even for this one, doesn't have to be so big, but even for every structure, we can achieve your designs with our concrete system, with our formwork system rather. So I call for my colleague now, he will talk a little bit now on scaffolding. Thank you. Effectiveness of using system formwork. Well, if it is very good, but most system framework, when you use it, it gives you more flexibility and cost effectiveness. It can never be here. It can never be here. You and I, you and I are the people. We have listened to what is being said and we keep quiet. That's why I say it can never be here. We continue to keep quiet. It will not work for us. We have had beautiful presentations, beautiful research, but implementation. Walking. Look at your face. Let me just use the almost second to the last presentation that was made about project management. I want to borrow the words of uh, when he was talking yesterday. He said we had it here in our books. Akon has it there, and by law, we should operate within that. That is We had it documented. We came, all of us, the seven of us in the industry, came to agree on the fact that the lawyers, the accountants, the administrators, and so on and so forth, have, have taken over project administration. We said yes project administration as a subject you can take, but when it relates to our industry, unless you belong to one of these seven, you can never, and it is so documented, and that is what we are implementing. If you take our conditions of engagement, like I said yesterday, it started with the ACON published one of 2011, based on that all the others adopted, and that is the ruling document. The definition of project management, please, the project manager as it is, for us, he is just for the logistics of the client. He has no right to give instruction, sign certificates, do this, do that. It is clearly stated. All the consultants employed are responsible for their actions. Please, I want us to realize that it is in that, con in that conditions of engagement that we have. And that is what, that is the ruling thing. Please carry it in your head. We operate as leader of the industry for position of strength derived from knowledge. I hear you say design. I'm not a designer, I'm an architect. I'm an architect. You are all architects, and some of you architects to be. We are architects. We should not shy away from that. Don't generalize. Don't call me a designer. I'm not a, I'm not a, design, a designer. Why? Is that what I am licensed to do? 
Are you shy? Are you shy? No. No. Please. The man who talked about three D and what and what and what. I come to the best of my knowledge. Brought. Brought. Um, what is the organization that Auto you pass out with? Autodesk. Autodesk. Yes. All universities, I'm aware, Akon wrote to them to say that key in into this program, if your program is accredited through us, you will get softwares from Autodesk, correct? Yes. Correct. Let us say it. Let us become Thank you. Is contemporary issues in architecture, executive order five, and the place of architecture and the con in okay and the construction industry. The presenter is architect Esther Gimo. Please join me to welcome her to the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to stand on existing protocol. My name is architect Gimo Esther. I'm presenting contemporary issues in architecture, executive order five, and the place of architecture and the construction industry. This slide, please. Next slide. For decades, architects and allied professionals have been craving for inclusion in various aspects of the economy and national development. Consequently, the presidential executive order Executive Order 5 came as a wake-up call to the professional responsibilities, improvement of professional services, inspirations and innovations, advancement in skills and technology, education and capacity development, business opportunities, and professional excellence for architects and the construction industry. The Presidential Executive Order 5 was signed by President Muhammad Buhari in February 2018 with the aim of promoting and giving preference to Nigerian content in contracts and science, engineering and technology. It is therefore pertinent on architects and allied professionals to key into strict pursuance of this order so as to make good use of the opportunities in RFDRA. <laughs> the aim of this paper is to examine the Executive Order 5 and to expose architects and allied professionals so the opportunities offered by this order to the Nigerian professional. The methodology used for this, this research is the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as the leg, enabling legal framework upon which executive orders are issued and project possible prospects and challenges offered by this, by this order to, the, to architects and the construction industry. Limitations. The Presidential Executive Order 5 being a new order, not so much has been documented on the experiences encountered by architects and allied professionals in the industry with respect to the implementation of the order. Consequently, most of the prospects and challenges mentioned in this paper are the opinions of the author which are open to further deliberations and possible corrections. The scope of this paper is simply to create awareness of the Presidential Executive Order 5 amongst architects and allied professionals and to expose the opportunities offered by the order to the professional. Extracts of the Presidential Executive Order 5. For want of time, I'll just um, pick a few of them. You can get the rest from the documents you have. You have preference. It says procuring entities shall give preference to Nigerian firms and companies in the award of contracts in line with the Public Procurement Act. Then there is accreditation. For me, I would say accreditation is key to preference. Accreditation says ministries, departments, and agencies shall ensure that any professional practicing in Nigeria must be duly registered with the appropriate regulatory body in Nigeria. That is key to preference. If you are not duly registered by the regulatory body, preference is not for you. If you are not duly registered by the re regulation body, the executive order is not for you. If you are not duly registered by the re regulatory body, permit me to say you do not have business with government projects, federal government projects, I know. <laughs> Even the expatriate co 
water that is is listed there also takes gets have, have to get accreditation for the from the regulatory body. I want to employ Acon to make good use of this opportunity and see how we can cover those loopholes that will even encourage the foreigners to come. Of course, there are loopholes, but we can sit as a body and do it together. Like the president said, we cannot do it alone. Already, most of us already have this idea that it can't happen in Nigeria. Our attitudes towards it has um, shown me that it can't happen. We are already seeing the, the, the benefits and possible uh, prospects from the other, but we are asking ourselves, is it possible? It is possible only if we unite and collaborate with other professionals in the industry. <laughs> the contract award is all, also boils down to accreditation. The language of contract is in English language, which is um, applicable in all projects. Then capacity development. It says ministries, departments, and agencies shall take steps to encourage indigenous professionals in diaspora to return home and use their expertise to develop Nigeria. We have a lot of them out there. Let us create the enabling environment for them to come home. And let's do it together. Together we can make it work. Then the federal government shall provide intervention funds to improve existing training programs in Nigerian universities, polytechnics, technical schools, and trade centers, and establish new programs to cope with the demands of the emerging technology. In the last colloquium, the NUC gave approval for, for the, the establishment of faculties of architecture in our various institutions. This is a good opportunity to explore that approval that, that has been granted us. Then, qualification from, from an award. It said a Nigerian company or firm shall not be disqualified from an award of contract by MDAs on the basis of the year of incorporation, but rather on the basis of qualification, competence, and experience of the management executing in the execution of similar products. Contracts rather. Database of experts. Here it is that the National Office for Technology Acquisition and Promotion shall develop, maintain, and regularly update a database of Nigerians with expertise in science, engineering, and technology and other fields of expertise. Yeah, a regular update on, on the architects register will do a lot for us here. You have local materials, tax incentives. Punishment for violation of the order, just like when you violate the law, there is a punishment attached to it. So if you violate the executive order, there are punishments that have been applied for it. You have the Presidential Monitoring and, and Evaluation Council, headed by the President itself as, as the Chairman. And then you have members of the Council, of who, which the, the Honorable Minister for Works, Works and Housing is, is part of the members. Application, the executive order shall be read in conjunction with the extant laws, regulations and guidelines governing public procurement, process implementation and professional practices in Nigeria, as well as those that are to be issued pursuant to this order. The effective date of the order, the executive order took effect from February 2018, meaning that we, 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 we are like a year into the order, how much have we done as professionals towards effecting, the, uh, with, towards exploiting the opportunities offered by the order? So go to the prospects of the executive order on the architecture profession and the construction industry. I will just list them for want of time. We have job creation, value addition in terms of capacity development, improve professional services and performance. Of course, you have to improve yourself professionally to be able to cope with the demands of this executive order. Then you have curricular upgrade. The, 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 the various uh, regulatory bodies have to up, up, update, upgrade their programs in order to accommodate, accommodate the opportunities that have been created by this order. Advancement in skills and technology and enhance business opportunities. Then we go to the profession and the construction industry. One, they have the attitudes of professionals towards policy implementation, 
monitoring, control, and sustainability. A lot of us are already asking ourselves, is it going to work in Nigeria? If it had worked in other countries, it can work here. Yes. Let us be grassroots le level for this money for the monitoring um, team said by the executive order. You have just the minister as a representative. I think there's need for that link even to the local government level for, for us to be um, represented even at the grassroots level. The lack of unity amongst architects and allied professionals, then the demands of advancement in skills and technology in the immediate is a challenge. Conclusion and recommendations. Here comes the opportunity for architects and allied professionals to be included in various aspects of the economy and national development in the guise of the Presidential Executive Order 5, let the profession make life out of this opportunity granted the industry by standing firm in unity as architects while collaborating with allied professionals to add value to the profession and the construction industry through strict pursuance and adequate monitoring and control of the implementation of the Executive Order 5. It is therefore recommended that there should be an annual colloquium of architects and allied professionals in the construction industry to review experiences on the implementation of the executive order for its sustainability. Architects and allied professionals should ad attempt diversification in unity and add value and life to the profession and construction industry at large. The Educational Regulatory Body, NUC and MBTU should review their, and upgrade their various standards in engineering and science to improve the curricula in these areas so as to address the challenges posed by this order. Ministry, department and agencies should be committed to strict monitoring and control as regards the implementation of the executive order file through adequate representation and delegation. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Esther. Um, I think uh, this is a duty for the regulatory body. Two people have talked about this executive order number five. Uh, Kara Yen did some exposition there, and I know um, that ACON is taking notes to see how this can be used um, to enhance the profession of architecture. Thank you, Esther. Um, is um, trying to share Rakia? Right yeah. <coughs> on sustainability and energy efficiency buildings? In practice, building sustainability means living in harmony with the natural environment, considering the social, environmental, and economic aspect of decisions, and reducing our footprint through a less energy, water, and material intensified, intensive lifestyle what is energy efficiency it is the consumption of less energy while maintaining or improving the comfort condition of the building for the occupant as compared to standard building the aims of this um, paper one is to maximizing the human comfort efficient planning design for change minimizing waste of spaces, minimizing construction expenses, materials to the materials, minimizing buildings maintenance expenses, protecting and improving natural values. Since this did it all in the, in the paper that we have been presented, in fact, they are the process to achieve that sustainability that we are all working on because Without all the other process, you'll discover a lot of challenges we're having in our constructions today. You'll see some constructions, they are not sustainable. After building for a while, then coming to maybe to, to other effects of energy efficiency in the building, it's not there. Then the next thing the contractor will not say, or the, the owner of the building will not say, I don't need this structure anymore. Uh, let, let's demolish it and rebuild. But rather, let's put more aesthetics to add more effect on it. So any active system should be selected on the basis of high efficiency. 
or to enable a reduction of cooling load appropriate to the climate. Let's go to the figures there. Your imagination towards the project and also the brief you collect from our own offices. The, the, the client you just come, so the, I have a size, so, so place, this is the... the, the this. After hearing or getting all the brief from the client, very simple, making the, the, the environment comfortable for the Ava is going to design in that, in that, uh, in that site. Then from there, you move into the implementation, you use the size to design, and implement it. So it is the duty of an architect, yes, you're putting down in your own design. So your orientation, you monitor it. That is the outcome of the construction. To see if it has come out to be change. That is the passive design principle, including the thermal mass, system to maintain comfort comfortable internal temperature. How will improve energy efficiency benefit me? multi-story buildings, it is important to ensure that ESD, that is the environmental best, that it will, if we stand by it, it will really help us. It will be good for us to, in all our design, we need to work to our country. And at times, our orientation of our buildings also matter because yesterday, and in another thing again, in, 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 in having a sustainable summary, when it is sunset, I will do when it is. And to do the summary is uh, educating would be architects, and that's going to be taken by. Certainly, it's my name, I can pronounce it. Scored. And at the end of the visit, at the end of the school inspection, the school will be awarded a provisional accreditation if it meets the mark. A full accreditation is given to the school. And this accreditation has a lifespan of three years. A school that doesn't have full accreditation has no business graduating students. And My question is to Frank, that uh, to put some practice. I have uh, just a few questions. One is why has the ACP and TP stopped? And what is the future of it? Secondly, what is the status of uh, HND graduates in the practice in the registration system? Let me put it that way. Then thirdly, why is it that every day we talk about quacks, 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 and there is no discipline on anybody? both in terms of uh, exam my practices and actual practice. Thank you very much. Ask your question. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Zuman from the <laughs> to ask, uh, I think it's Frank, okay, on a uh, professional judo thing. In, yeah? Professional judo issue, issue, issue. You see, in, in 2008 or 9, 
I was the head of the department there, and uh, Ali was the president of ACO. This professional juror issue creates problems for the schools, and we have been looking for a way to solve that problem. We suggested in a meeting for heads of school with ACO that we will apply for professional jurors and ACON will submit a true truth to us, their uh, jurors, so that we can pass it through the school system for approval. Because ACON, most of the people that come for our, profit, for our examination are members of uh, NIA and ACON. Because this matter at this forum or in the meeting of council. So my question goes to the presenter on executive order five. In the early days of uh, in the Northern Administration, architects were invited from all over the country to the banquet hall of the villa on MG, MG, MDG projects. We gathered and we were all briefed. Then suddenly, there was no second meeting because we were told the senator said we couldn't be appointed. The projects belonged to them. I'm sure some of you were involved. And so, the senators hijacked projects and of course employed us us in put on their own terms as I didn't get I don't know what the terms were so then I believe we may have to address this again in full council session. I know those projects were executed, and I know our colleagues took part in them. But my question is this. What will happen to us in the context of executive order number five. Are we going to continue to be patronized by senators and members of the House of Rep? Are we going to get projects directly as we ought to get? That's the question. If I have to present on the paper, but for all of us, I'm better still to be handled by Accra Council. Uh, yes, more questions, please. More questions. Yes, yes, let's see you. Let's see you, please. I don't get there is. I have two questions to ask. One, so, you see. And the other one to the last speaker. And then persons living with disabilities into sustainable integrated community. Have we got any right? Different types of disabilities come and it is sponsored from outside red through your store. It was like you made references to America. My second question is a follow-up of my question yesterday. I did ask a question. That's why I referred to quick questions that need responses. 
camp planners try to even dominate us. I have discussed it with the chairman of Abia State Chapter. And our conclusion is what I want to make as a general recommendation to all states. Let us also sponsor bills in the states to give a profession prominence in everything that, is, that has to do with construction and development, including the approval process. That bill, for instance, should make it compulsory for every planning office to have an architect. It should. In this connection, let me remind you that all professions are trying to survive. Take the lawyers, for instance. A few years back, all the customary costs were presided over by people who knew the customs and traditions of people. The lawyers fought, and today, let me say specifically in the States, all customary costs, and there are more than 200 of them, are presided over by lawyers. Any other person is a member. The chairman must be a lawyer. They created jobs for themselves. They created responsibilities for themselves. And today, they enjoy the privilege of presiding over all customer costs. We can also, through legislation, lobby for the architect to be the approving officer. Thank you.